Good afternoon, everyone. So we have a mixed event, so exec ed, so glad you're here with us. Law school and public and other people, so glad you're also here with us. This is kind of exciting, different format for us. I'm Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library, so I want to thank you for joining the Law Library Book Talk today. Um, copies of today's book are for sale in the back corner of the room. Um, and our panelists will be available to sign them after the presentation, I'm pretty sure. Um, just so you know, today's talk is being recorded by the law school, and the question and answer portion of the program will also be recorded, so if you're concerned about privacy, I just want you to know that up front. The recording will be available on the law school's YouTube channel sometime next week. I also want to thank the dean's office for making lunch at the law library's book talk possible. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce our panel part of which is here and part of which is over here, and they'll be coming up a little bit later. Um, our panel is here today to discuss their recent work, The Indian Legal Profession in the Age of Globalization, the Rise of the Corporate Legal Structure, and its Impact on Lawyers and Society. Um, first, I'm going to introduce Professor Wilkins. He's the Lester Kissel Professor of Law, Vice Dean for Global Initiatives on the Legal Profession, and Faculty Director of the Center on the Legal Profession and the Center for Lawyers and the Professional Services Industry. He doesn't do much um, at the Harvard Law School. He's also a Senior Research Fellow of the ABA Foundation and a Fellow of the Harvard University Edmund J. Safra Foundation Center for Ethics. Professor Wilkins is currently working on a number of projects, as he always is. Um, the one specific of specific relevance to today's book's talk is his project on globalization, lawyers, and emerging technologies, where he directs over 50 researchers studying the impact of globalization on the market for legal services in rapidly developing countries countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Eastern Europe, which is a pretty cool project. Um, next, we have Professor Vic Khanna, who's sitting over here. He's the William W. Cook Professor of Law at the University of Michigan School of Law and is the faculty director of the Directors College for Global Business and Law and co-director co of the Joint Center for Global Corporate and Financial Law and Policy, which is a joint collaboration between Michigan Law and the Indians Jindal Global Law School. Professor Khanna, a special sort of close to our heart here at Harvard, uh, earned his LLM and SJD here, and he has also served as a visiting professor here at Harvard. The panel will be moderated a little bit lo later in our program by Professor Tarun, close, Khanna. <laughs> he is the um, Jorge Paulo Lehman Professor at the Harvard Business School. Professor Khanna teaches in the areas of corporate governance, strategy, and international business, and his area of research centers on entrepreneurship and emerging markets. So without further ado, I'll put, turn it over to Professor Wilkins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you all for coming. I want to thank our terrific uh, participants in our leadership and law firms course, uh, many of whom actually know way more about the subject uh, of this book than we do, so we're going to give them an opportunity to talk. And it's so fantastic to see so many colleagues and students uh, who are interested in India specifically, but more importantly, the globalization of the legal profession. Uh, what, uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to give kind of an introduction about the project and about the book. Uh, my uh, co-editor Vikram Khanna is going to come and talk a little bit about some of our key findings. And then we are so happy to have Tarun Khanna, who is one of the world's foremost authority on, the, on India and in, on the Indian corporate market in particular, uh, give us some comments, but also talk about his own fascinating uh, research. So. Um, this is kind of the, 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 the world in which we're trying to understand in this project. Uh, we all talk about the emerging economies or the BRICS, and we know that there are countries over the last uh, 20 years that have really achieved un unprecedented growth. And a key factor in that unprecedented growth of the BRICS or other emerging economies is what we call in the book kind of the global shift that happened in many of these countries in the 1990s. Uh, and that was, roughly speaking, an opening of these countries more or less to the world economy, from being quite closed to more or less open. Now, I say more or less quite advisedly because no country is completely open, certainly not our own here in the United States, so it's a sliding scale, but yet a significant transformation 
from where, say, India was before 1991. Uh, and when countries open more or less to the global economy, uh, what it does is it creates immediately a need for a new kind of law that you never had before. You need to have trade law. You need to have investment law. You need to have antitrust law. You need a whole variety of domestic laws and you need new institutions that connect that domestic law to the broader global economy and the institutions of global governance. And you see all of these countries developing new legal structures. But it doesn't take long before you realize if you have new laws, you need new lawyers, or at least lawyers with new and different kinds of skills than the traditional lawyers that you had, which was typically lawyers who operated, uh, who argued cases in court. That's kind of the core of the legal profession uh, in most countries. This is going on, but on the other hand, there still uh, isn't a traditional, there still is a traditional legal profession underneath. Law, after all, has always been the most local of professions, bounded by local law, by language, by culture, and by geography. Today, we know none of these things are as constraining as they were before, and yet, there is no single global law, let alone a global culture and not even a global language, although many of us are lucky enough to be able to speak English around the world, it still is true that local language and culture matter significantly. And while technology allows distant contact, the fact of the matter is how many of you would be here if I was just showing up on this screen, right? contact in person still matters. The result is a complex system which is both global in many dimensions but also local. Hence this silly word globalization which is just global and local stuck together. What does this mean for corporate clients? Look, increasingly large multinationals need multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdictional expertise as they move around the world. And they want this whether or not local regulation permits it or otherwise. And these companies at the same time are expanding their global supply chains, disaggregating processes, and increasingly facing competition at every step of the way. To manage this, companies are now internalizing legal expertise. This is a trend that started in the United States, probably in the late 1970s, early 1980s, but is moving now significantly around the world. Companies hiring lawyers internally in order to help them to navigate an increasingly complex global environment. This, in turn, has produced new corporate law firms in many countries around the world. It used to be only the United States had large law firms that focused mostly on business transactions. Then that moved to the UK. Then it moved to continental Europe. Increasingly, we're seeing this trend move around the world. And one of the big things we study in this project is the development of increasingly sophisticated corporate or commercial law firms in countries in the emerging economies around the world. And one of the reasons why it's thrilling to give this talk in this room is, as I said, many of the people who are here for our Leadership in Law Firms course are exactly the lawyers who are pioneering this trend. The law firms are growing in size and scope and profitability. And there's now an increasingly globally competitive market between these new law firms, which have developed in countries such as India and China and Brazil and South Africa and many others, and increasingly large global players based mostly in the US or the UK or in Europe who are seeking to serve those markets. 
And this is being pushed by a tremendous growth in cross-border economic activity. Yes, there are trade restrictions. Yes, we may be going through a period in which people are questioning globalization. But the fact of the matter is, is that the growth in cross-border exchange uh, is not going to stop. And it's not just moving in one direction. That is, we used to think of it as only moving from what you might call the developed uh, economies of the global north to the global south. But now we have many important uh, companies, state-owned, economic players, private companies, moving from the global south to other places in the global south or also to the global north. And this is fueling a demand not just for a new kind of lawyer, but for a new kind of legal education, which moves beyond the traditional ways that lawyers have been educated all over the world. Uh, and that then is pushing a contest over regulation. Because again, law and lawyers have traditionally been regulated locally, and yet they're increasingly practicing globally which is putting pressure not just on the, on the regulatory structure, but even more basic question. What does it mean to be a lawyer in an increasingly globalized environment? All these changes, I think everybody in this room knows to one degree or another are going on. But there's been little systematic research about how these trends are playing out in particular areas. And so, the Project on Globalization, Lawyers, and Emerging Economies, or GLEE, as we like to call it. Some of you will recognize that's a popular TV show from the United States. Uh, I don't sing and I don't uh, wear a tracksuit, but I do study how is globalization reframing the market for legal services in the important emerging economies of the world, and how is that in turn changing the entire way in which we think about the market for legal services. Uh, to do this, we've assembled an incredible team of researchers uh, from around the world. It's a multinational, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary uh, project in which we're looking at a broad range of things, ranging from the development of a new sophisticated corporate legal sector in many parts of the world to how that's affecting legal education, public values of the legal profession, regulation of the legal profession, et cetera. Um, we've been working uh, in India, as you will see, but also we have a book coming out in Brazil. We have another one coming out about China. And we're beginning now to look at what I think is going to be the most important and dynamic, not just legal market, but marketplace uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century, and that's Africa. Uh, everybody I know wants to understand how is the world unfolding uh, in Africa from the Middle East to Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's what we're going to try to understand. Uh, but we began our work in India, and uh, we're very proud uh, that we have tried to document how in India this shift is taking place to a more globalized legal profession. So, you will see in the back a trim little 975 page volume. What can I say? There's a lot to say. Uh, published by Cambridge University Press, as all of our books are published, and we are very honored to have John Berger, our editor, who has made all of this possible, sitting here in the front row as we lobby for even more books and even more pages. Um, and uh, the book contains 22 chapters uh, by, over thir by 30 authors based not just in the US, but in India, the UK, Singapore, Europe. Because if you want to understand a complex problem like this, you have to have people coming at it from all different areas. And each chapter is based on original research that's done around some of these big changes I've been talking about. Uh, it's divided into seven sections. Uh, the first is a kind of introductory section, and that's really what I've tried to give you a summary about today, and Vic will also talk about this, in which we try to locate what's happening in India, both within the context of globalization, 
but also within the unique context of India. Remember, globalization, both are going on. We then look at the growth of the corporate legal sector in India, from large law firms to in-house legal uh, departments to an increasing number of boutique law firms. We then look at new kinds of actors, like uh, legal process outsourcing, like women, like pro bono, which is coming to India for the first time in an official way. Uh, we look at how the legal uh, profession is regulated and the contest over regulation in India, which Vic will say a few more words about. Uh, and we look at how all of this is affecting the traditional legal profession in India, the advocates, the small town lawyers, how are they being impacted by these global changes. Uh, and finally, we look at legal education and how it's being transformed and how India is trying to develop capacity to operate in the institutions of global governance. Four key questions I want to kind of just focus our attention on what we raise in the book. First, to what extent is the kind of Anglo-American model of legal practice, you know, the US, the UK, that many of you are familiar with, how much is that coming to India and shaping the way in which the corporate legal practice or what we call the corporate hemisphere in India is developing? And if, if there is diffusion of this kind, what practices have influenced that diffusion? But equally important, how is the Indian corporate legal sector uh, retaining distinctly Indian uh, attributes? Uh, how are these global transplants, in fact, being remade uh, by their interaction with things that are unique to the Indian uh, environment? And finally, how is all of this affecting India as a country, its economic, political, and social development, and its connections to the world? Uh, what we're going to talk about here is just a kind of small fraction of what's in the tub. We won't read all 972 pages, uh, but instead, uh, we will have a terrific discussion with Professor Khanna, uh, actually both Professors Khanna, but I will ask Professor Vikram Khanna to come to the stage. Thank you. Um, thanks, David, and thanks, uh, Tarun, for uh, being here today. And for all of you, uh, thank you for coming. We're delighted uh, to be able to celebrate our book launch with you all. And thanks also to Harvard Law School and the Law Library uh, for organizing this wonderful event. Now, as uh, David was mentioning, I'm going to talk a little bit about why, given how fascinating and exciting Glee is, we would choose to begin with India. What makes India so special as a place to look at? Of course, most people would immediately recognize the fact that India has a very large population and an increasing one and a lot of resources. But although those are both important, I would suggest that that just begins to scratch the surface of what makes India fascinating for people interested in the legal professions and also uh, globalization and the impact on the economy. I'm going to refer to these as the four Ds of India. Okay. Uh, the first one, of course, is India is striving for economic development. Now, of course, law is important to this. Uh, many, many studies and even just common experience would suggest that having a rule of law is helpful to the growth of an economy and increasing exposure to more trade routes and more trade patterns, such as globalization, would be helpful too. So this, of course, makes India a good focal point for those interested in development. At the same time, however, India is the world's largest democracy. That is important when you mix that with development. Development, by definition, will create winners, economic winners, and those who actually lose in the development process. In a democracy, the people whose interests are harmed by the transitional changes are more likely to vote against the ruling coalition, which puts an immediate constraint on the speed and, shall we say, the braveness of the political leaders to push forward with certain kinds of reforms. India being the world's largest democracy, striving for development immediately puts you in this kind of conflicted position that you're trying to push forward on development, but you'll have some subsector of the economy voting against certain changes. On top of which, India presents with possibly the most diverse population one is going to come across. Roughly speaking, 23 official languages uh, across India, approximately 1,600 recognized languages throughout the country, all the major world religions, 
and all kinds of incredible other diversity throughout the country. That means that it's not always easy to generate a political consensus to do something, which also works as a way to slow down reform efforts because you need to build those negotiated bridges and connect all the dots so that people can work together to get the kinds of reforms they need to grow the economy. This suggests that things are going to be moving somewhat slowly in India. And this is indeed what a lot of people have noticed over the last 70 years, that reform doesn't always occur with the kind of speed that one might desire it to happen with. And that, of course, brings us to the fourth D of India, which is demography. So as many of you might know, India has a very large population, but it's also very, very young. Roughly speaking, two-thirds to three-quarters of India's population is below the age of 40. That means in a country of 1.25 billion people, you have roughly speaking 750 to 800 million people below the age of 40. That is an incredibly large number. And the replacement rate in India is greater than two, which means the bottom is getting bigger. India is actually getting younger every year. Now, one way to view this is that's fabulous. That provides India with a demographic dividend that, that gives it a massive production base and a huge consumption base. Another way to look at it is that you also need to have employment opportunities for this vast base, otherwise there could be substantial social unrest. The demographic situation in India creates an urgency for development that is not always present in some context. That means that political leaders have to find ways to overcome some of the implicit delays in the Indian system because of the democracy, the diversity, and so forth, to be able to push forward with the urgency that the demography demands for development. Those four Ds of India provide you with a conflicting picture of how this is going to happen. Now, conflict is, of course, interesting. One of the great things about law is the law is one of the key mediating influences in this environment. And because of that, the legal profession becomes a very important player in India striving for development given these four Ds. So as I mentioned, the legal profession will play a critical role in finding ways to negotiate the problems and the issues. And one hopes to learn a lot about how development can occur in this kind of democratic, diverse society when you have these kinds of pressures at play. One of the motivating factors behind why we chose India first was precisely this. Another thing that's probably worth noting about the Indian context is when you look at all of the four Ds of India, another system seems somewhat similar to that, which is the overall global structure, where you have lots of diversity, many more democratic countries than you did before, many of them striving for development, and many of them having very, very young populations, suggesting that whatever lessons we learn from the Indian context might actually be relevant not just inside of India and a few other emerging markets, but in understanding how the global legal order can play an important role in the sort of contributions that globalization makes to economics, knowledge, and other features as well. So when we looked at India, it presented us with both a fascinating case study in and of itself, but also with the potential for a lot of insights to go beyond the borders of India, to go beyond its actual shores. So as Professor Wilkins mentioned, what I'm going to do in my few minutes here is to provide you with the, some of the select key findings we have from our study. And of course, since the book is quite heavy, I won't be able to go into all of the findings, but hopefully we can touch upon some of them that we think are indicative and hopefully provide us with a deeper sense of how important the Glee project is to both India and elsewhere. All right, so I thought I'd begin with talking about how when you look at India, you learn something about how the global legal profession is changing as India rises uh, in, in the economy and elsewhere. One way in which this is the case is India has been critical to the growth of a global supply chain for legal services. Sometimes this is called the outsourcing movement, but I think it's actually perhaps better called a global supply chain, where when you go to, for example, a law firm in the UK or even in the US, you discover that a lot of the work is being done in multiple places, sometimes in the US, sometimes in India, sometimes in Hungary, sometimes in other places. In one model, you might think of it as Humpty Dumpty has been broken into a lot of different pieces, and now people are trying to stitch them back up from all the different countries. India has been critical in this because, of course, a lot of outsourcing work in the global space was being routed through India, and this is true also for legal outsourcing. Now that legal arts outsourcing is beginning to grow even more quickly, what we're observing is almost a restructuring of the architecture of law practice. 
Nowadays, you're seeing many, many different things happening in the environment of how law is practiced in the more developed economies. Now, although, of course, outsourcing is indeed becoming more pervasive, I suspect that the employment effects are not going to be as significant as the effects on the competitive structure of law practice, the size of law firms, often making them much smaller, and how legal teams are being formed. When you look at how the process of outsourcing is playing out in the competitive structure of law practice, what you're seeing is competition coming from even more and more highly specialized players in the litigation or transactional business who can outsource much of their back office to India, thereby enabling them to focus more on the big ticket items, which of course means now there's more competition amongst those big ticket items throughout the globe. And similarly, when you're looking at how legal teams are being formed now, it's no longer the case that you just need to go to one law firm to get all of your needs met. You may be actually able to get them met through different players who work together in almost a project management capacity. That inures to suggest that you might see a difference in how legal teams and legal work itself is being performed, changing, in essence, the architecture of law practice in the developed world. Of course, India's rise has a lot to do in India, too. And in some ways, the changes in the Indian legal profession are in a state of transition. As Professor Wilkins was mentioning, there are many, many local elements in India's response to globalization, which is where we've come up with this delightful term, glocalization. Right? You see in-house departments growing substantially in India. Over the last eight years, there's been an increase of approximately 100% in legal spending across most Indian firms that are publicly traded. That is remarkable when you think about what the global state of the legal profession has been over the last eight years. Um, India is perhaps the fastest growing legal market there is at the moment. Um, yet in this fast growing environment where in-house councils are taking more and more of a professional role in managing the legal affairs of their companies, you still see many of the local elements strong and proud in the Indian context. Sometimes this is represented by family connections between those people working in the in-house departments and the companies, and sometimes by broader kinship connections. And indeed, as in-house players in India have become bigger strategic players, you often find that the most effective strategic players are the most commonly used in India are those that share certain kinship ties with the owning or the controlling family of the business suggesting that there's a still a lot of unspoken or may, maybe social norms-based ways in which people are interacting. Another way in which you sort of see this is even in the rise or the changing in the grand advocate structure in India. As more and more things get professionalized in India, one might think that grand advocates, the senior advocates in India, might have a lesser role to play. Quite the contrary. Our study suggests that actually their role has increased dramatically. But even within the grand advocates, you see the same strong kinship fa uh, family structures at play. And that leads to interesting thoughts about what exactly is happening in the overall structure of law practice in India as it's responding to globalization. Are we seeing new classes, new castes of players come up, or are they extensions of the pre-existing classes and caste as they replicate in some ways into newish environments? Also, I should mention, whenever you're looking at India, um, there's a word that one should become familiar with, jugad. Those of you who've spent time in India will be familiar with the word. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the word, I encourage you to get familiar with it. It's a wonderful concept, and it really is quite uh, unleashing its power in some ways in the Indian context. Jugad essentially means improvisation for that one instance. So most countries and most cultures have some notion of improvisation. But usually that leads to a structured system of doing things over time. In India, the incredible thing about Jugard is it leads to improvisation that works just that once. If you tried the same thing the next day, it wouldn't work. That level of fluidity and flexibility in the Indian environment allows for much greater ability to adapt to changing circumstances. But comes with, it comes with the cost that it's hard to actually then set up structured systems because People are accustomed to finding ways to work around them. We found that even as we looked at the legal profession in India, that people who are, who are operative in the legal profession, starting from the very junior levels to the most senior levels, are very accustomed to doing workarounds that work for a short period of time. I'll just give you two quick examples. At the sort of starting point level, you have people who are in law school in India looking for jobs. There are no placement offices in Indian law schools. And most Indian law firms do not actually have hiring departments. 
So how do you make the two ends meet? The students in India improvise an entire system of recruitment on their own. They're typically called recruitment committee cells or something like that. They've developed their own internalized system. No one gets paid. No one receives any uh, compensation. No real records are kept of where people go. Yet, the players inside the system, the students, have designed a system whereby they help people to submit their CVs to the law firms, vet the CVs, rank them amongst the various students, and then arrange interviews, all for no compensation. And people end up getting hired. They have very strong rules. If you violate them, you're kicked out of the structure. It's actually quite a remarkable example of Jugard op operating at essentially the entry level to law practice. But even at the more advanced levels, you see the same sort of behavior. For example, if you look at the development of the mortgage market in India, it's a story where the law made it very difficult for mortgages to develop because it would take 20 years to foreclose on a property. That's not an exaggeration. That's an accurate estimate, roughly speaking. 20 years to foreclose on a mortgage would make it unattractive to actually write a mortgage, which is why India did not have a mortgage market of any significance until 1993. The Indian mortgage market in 1993 was approximately one two hundredth the size of the US mortgage market. That's incredible since India has four times as many people. In 1993, the mortgage market in India starts to grow, although there's no law change. When you explore how that change occurred, you discover that the in-house councils at the banks came up with a series of jugards to make people more likely to pay their mortgages. I won't, uh, I won't uh, sort of uh, give you the punchline immediately, but let's put it this way. They rely upon dysfunctions in the Indian legal system to cure the dysfunctions in the civil justice system. A true example of can two wrongs make a right that then leads to actually the development of what the new legal order for mortgages would be. So whether you're looking at the entry level or at the most advanced level, you're seeing that kind of improvisation leading to new structures that are in play and those new sort of improvisational moves are made because you're seeing that pressure coming from globalization, whether it's more people moving into the cities to push up the mortgage market, or whether it's a huge demand for law students leading there to be a need to create a structure to sort of organize how you hire people. All right. In addition to that, I thought we should, of course, mention that changes in the legal profession also redound to changes in the economy, too. I'll give you one example, although there are many. Right? Most recently, India has a program called the Aadhaar scheme. Aadhaar is the largest biometric identification scheme in the world. There are 1.2 billion Indians registered in it. It's designed to be a way in which one can get potential government benefits, deposit uh, to have a bank account, for all kinds of other e-related services. Of course, an issue that comes up when you have something this broad is what happens to all the data that's being collected inside of these systems. So very recently, the Indian Supreme Court came down with a decision holding that there's a constitutional right to privacy. Now, I can go into the, the details of it, but what's interesting for me, aside from many other things, is the fact that this case was actually triggered by a retired judge in India and brought by attorneys who bring a version of public interest litigation. This is one of the things the legal profession in India actually can do. India has much more relaxed standing requirements than most other countries. So you can have people bring suits for things that are considered public interest matters. That's what this actually is. There are concerns that if the government has this much information about you, what does that do to your civil liberties? Are there constraints on what they can do with your data? In a 547 page decision, I'm not kidding, that's an accurate number again, the Indian Supreme Court held nine to zero that there is a constitutional right to privacy. And they compared it to developments across the globe, as well as theoretical and philosophical implications of it, and began to lay the foundations for how one might think about this in terms of data privacy and data protection. Now, the way this impacts business in India and globally is incredible, right? If you're a mobile business, this matters to you because you're collecting data whenever you're doing a transaction. If you're Google, people are searching on you. You're getting data about them. If you're Facebook, the social networking data is becoming available. India is taking a leading position in regulating the space through the efforts of members of the legal profession, which can have pretty large impacts globally given the sectors we're talking about and given the nature of the information-based economy we're moving towards. In my last few minutes, I want to briefly address just one thing, which is, of course, 
we don't intend to stop have, having written this wonderful book on India. There are many interesting issues going forward that relate to how the developments in the legal profession are going to impact India's polity, right? The role of law, the legal profession, and development, as an example being the mortgage market, but many others, is a topic that we are very, very interested in exploring further, and one that might be quite important to those thinking about how does one consider emerging market development. Uh, we also noticed that law, law firms and Indian in-house departments are increasingly engaged in the acts of lobbying government to produce new rules and new laws. That is beginning to track developments in the US and it suggests we have a new, very important player in the political economy of the Indian space. And finally, of course, as the role of the Indian state changes from essentially telling people what to do to more allowing them to negotiate and regulating on the outside, that means the role of lawyers will become even more important because now that parties have choices about how to structure their legal affairs, presumably they'll make those choices. Who is going to be informing them about what their options are and what the likelihoods are of what they're doing? That would be the legal profession and one of the topics that we're hopefully going to be exploring in greater depth more. With that, I'll end and I'll hand over the floor to Professor Kutna. Thank you. Tarun, you can stand, sit, whatever. Sure, I'll sit, why not? Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tarun Khanna. I'm the less talented Khanna on the bench. Uh, <laughs> but I will try to uh, uh, measure up. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Let me just say a little bit by way of background. I'm actually a mathematician, masquerading as an entrepreneur, <laughs> and sitting at, uh, at HBS, where I've taught for the last 25 years. And I'm not an India expert either, even though I'm obviously Indian. Um, I'm interested in... Uh, um, how countries develop and the role that individual entrepreneurs can play in the development process. My chair is Brazilian. I you know, lead HBS's efforts in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, so I'm not an India specialist. So take my, uh, so what I, what I, I was trying to think sitting here, what could I add to this constellation of legal minds? Um, and obviously the answer has to be nothing about the law. Um, so I will skirt around the law and imagine what might be of interest to you from my various hats as an entrepreneur, an academic, and uh, as a semi-insider in the government of India. Um, um, and I thought I would uh, divide my, uh, my comments into three buckets that I have some experience with. The first is the role of uh, corporates and entrepreneurs in, in countries like India, but in India in particular. Um, comparing uh, my engagement um, uh, with law firms, including the uh, so-called Big Five that are profiled in one of the chapters in this book, um, most of whom I've had some direct engagement with in my board roles in India. If I compare them to U.S. board engagements with boards that are represented in this room, probably, uh, they're really quite different um, in many senses. The, the, the engagement in the Indian boardrooms, even with the best of the best, for appropriate reasons, having to do with Jugard and having to do with the transition from a more informal sense of engagement to a more formal system, um, there, 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 is a, there is a learning curve to both on the lawyer side and on the entrepreneur side to making good use of the law and understanding what the bright lines are. Um, and I think that transition, uh, th there needs to be more effort in that, in that marriage of legal expertise with corporate expertise or entrepreneurial expertise on both sides. The entrepreneurs need to take it more seriously, and the, court, and the law firms need to take it more seriously, in my view. Let me say wh why, why this is needed. Not just because uh, David started off by talking about, of course, the law has to be concerned with the fabric of society and what have you. Of course, that's true. But I think one of the things that's happening in India that is perhaps a little bit different than, say, Brazil or South Africa or any of the other countries is that uh, in pockets, technology is really outpacing society's ability to keep up with it, particularly in the context of a poor developing country, uh, poor um, socialist-leaning, uh, aggressively democratic, uh, uh, fast-moving, uh, technologically conscious country. I'm choosing those words intentionally because that's an odd juxtaposition of adjectives to put before economy, and it, it raises all sorts of interesting questions. Let me give you two examples. Um, Vikram mentioned uh, 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 biometrics, right? Uh, you know, he didn't even begin to scratch the kinds of legal conundrums that have begun to come up 
uh, just, just recently, of which the last uh, Supreme Court ruling just, what, two weeks ago, um, is only the latest in a series of, uh, of attempts by uh, fine legal minds to wrestle with these issues. Um, uh, the, the, the creator of Aadhaar, the biometric ID, uh, actually is in Boston these days, so you guys should engage with him, um, uh, Nanda Nilkani, very interesting fellow. Another area where technology has outpaced uh, the ability of the laws to keep up with it, and this would, of course, be a familiar, uh, familiar um, um, sounding theme to anybody who's interested in the development of institutions. Anytime technology runs amok in a good way, it takes a while for uh, society and norms and regulations and laws to catch up with it for the most part. Uh, for the most part. Another area that's very interesting in the Indian context is space. Um, and I've gotten involved with the, um, through an accident, quirk of circumstance, with the Indian Space Research Organization, which has acquired some notoriety recently because it's able to lob things around Mars at you know, 7% of the cost of NASA um, uh, with a very, very clever algorithms, to a mathematician, very clever algorithms, essentially. Uh, not really novel science, but novel mathematics, really, to lob uh, things that uh, we spend a lot more money here in this country in NASA. So NASA has, of course, become very interested in it and is trying to figure out how to uh, enter into research and commercial agreements with the Indian Space Research Organization. And that's where the ac absence of, if you will, corporate expertise, um, even legal expertise, uh, comes into play. That we just don't have, uh, I imagine in the August law firms represented here, um, uh, there are many of you who specialize in particular sectors. Uh, there will be people who are experts in uh, health law, there will be experts in space law, in whatever, etc. Uh, I think those pools of expertise are quite lacking in India, and it becomes a real handicap for entities like, say, the Space Research Organization to understand what is the, the, the domain, the space of possibilities, no pun intended, uh, for commercial agreements between the intellectual property that they find themselves having amassed uh, willy-nilly and dealing with the rest of the corporate world at large. So the point I'm trying to make with biometrics and space is to just pick two different areas where science has run far ahead uh, of, uh, of the legal profession in some ways. And in a developing country like India, I think that lag is particularly long and potentially particularly costly, uh, costly in the sense that you're not um, uh, capturing all the social surplus that you might. So I think the, the, the corporates and the government entities as the clients of the law firms and the law firms have, uh, have much work to do. Another really interesting area where one of your colleagues, uh, David uh, uh, Glenn, what's his name? Glenn Cohen, Glenn Cohen has, uh, done some nice work is on medical tourism. Yes. So uh, where again you see that uh, the laws that adjudicate potential disputes for patients who are traveling across health jurisdictions uh, are really uh, underspecified. Uh, so I'm involved with an effort by a very prominent heart surgeon to uh, open tertiary healthcare facilities uh, in the Cayman Islands. Uh, and in the Cayman Islands because uh, this thing is being videoed, right? No. Uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of lawyers here, so I'll, I'll choose my words carefully. Um, it, let's just say it was difficult to enter the U.S. Uh, for a variety of reasons that I don't consider to be uh, good ethical reasons. But having, uh, so this is a person who can do heart surgery at literally 1% of the cost that we do it in, in our local hospitals at, at better quality, potentially. Uh, very well documented, uh, certified by uh, if you will, the U.S. health authorities, et cetera. But we can't get it into here, so we decided to open the Cayman Islands uh, because it's only a one-hour flight from Miami or Dallas or someplace like that. But it raises all kinds of interesting legal issues of liability and tort reform and insurance and this and that. Um, and Glenn has been looking at this. So it's another area where things coming out of unlikely, historically unlikely seeming sources of technological progress um, uh, are, are struggling more than they should, I think, to have their benefits realized for all sorts of societies. So that's my first comment, uh, the role of uh, entrepreneurs, if you will, and how they should be thinking about this, this mismatch between capability and legal institutions. The second has to do with what I titled here pro-social behavior. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, it's my belief that uh, in societies where the institutional mechanisms for doing all sorts of good things uh, are underdeveloped because societies have simply not had enough time to build those institutions. It, and I'll include India in that, which is my country of origin. Um, uh, it falls to entrepreneurs and corporates to do much more than they are even legally required to do. 
Now, recently, India passed a controversial law, a CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Law, mandating that publicly traded corporations above a certain size threshold have to spend X percentage of net profits doing so-called CSR work. That's fine. There was a vigorous debate about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, what have you, and I played a role in that, in that process. Uh, but even independent of that, uh, I think uh, far-sighted entrepreneurs in India for a couple of centuries have recognized uh, that they effectively have to do uh, what the law is now trying to mandate them to do, which is it is in your private commercial interest to engage in the partial provision of public goods. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, sort of correctly. So things that we would normally hope that the state would do, because the state is dysfunctional, um, underdeveloped, inept, corrupt, depending on time and space, who you're referring to, um, it falls to the entrepreneur to do those things, those pro-social things. And I think that there is, there is a nexus between that comment and the role that the legal profession can play in helping that process along. I do not see uh, lawyers in India or Brazil or in Africa or in the Middle East taking that seriously, uh, remotely seriously, actually. I'm happy to be corrected um, um, by somebody who has a different point of view uh, by email, if possible, because that is a substantive issue that's worth, worth pursuing. Um, so that's my second comment. What, what, do, what, what should we hold uh, entrepreneurs in the legal profession, what should we hold their collective feet to the fire for? My view is that we should hold their feet to the fire to make sure that things that the state is unable to do because of lack of capability um, and other reasons, um, we should hold their feet to the fire so that they do more of this pro-social stuff. It is in society's interest. Uh, frankly, it's a moral issue. Um, the last comment I'll make in passing, because I know we have to end. There are students here who have to leave, uh, leave shop at one. Um, uh, I'm an active entrepreneur. I start a lot of companies in different countries around the world. And one of the, things, one of the frustrations that I face in India in particular is uh, there's no such thing as startup law, uh, whatever the heck that means. Uh, there is over here. I mean, there are people who specialize in it. There are people who participate uh, in the discussion of what an entrepreneur uh, ought to be doing when he or she is trying to start something, uh, something new. Uh, that capability, uh, despite you know, the press that sometimes places like Bangalore get in, uh, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, the capability uh, of the informed um, uh, uh, council uh, is missing. And very often what we have to do for our startups in Bangalore or uh, Shenzhen or someplace like that is find lawyers in Boston, which of course is a very poor substitute uh, for, uh, for that particular need. Um, so those are my three comments. Um, uh, one about uh, the role of how the marriage, the productive marriage between corporates and lawyers uh, could be fostered. Uh, the second about pro-social behavior that I think is underemphasized. And the third uh, about the startup ecosystem. So excuse the um, disconnected nature of the three, uh, but those are three that come from my experience and I thought might be worth mentioning in passing. Uh, but thank you very much for giving me space. Yeah. Thank you. Far from being disconnected, I thought they were incredibly perceptive and very important for everybody in this room, both the lawyers in the room and also the students. So uh, we've managed to uh, do something law professors and professors in general almost never do, which is to end actually on time. And so we have time for questions. So uh, I don't know if there are, are we doing microphones? or to, Yes, there's a microphone in the back, so just uh, put your hand up if anybody... Uh, uh, would like to ask a question of any of us or, or about anything related to, to India and globalization. Don't be shy. Well, I I, I'm about to call on my friends from Ketan and company. I never thought that lawyers were shy. <laughs> yeah. No, no. All right. Oh, God. Here we go. Over here. Thank you. I, these are, I've been with these people all week. They haven't been shy on asking <laughs> questions. Yes, please. And if you mind just, just saying, especially for the, our lawyer friends of the world, say a little bit about, you know, two seconds about yourself so we have some idea of the context. Um, my name is Jeroen Auerhunt. I'm a lawyer in the Netherlands. I work for Clifford Chance. Uh, and I had a uh, question for Professor Tarun Kana. Uh, your pro-social responsibility, that I find... Interesting, if I understood you correctly, you said um, there is not enough of that, basically, if I can summarize it as that. Whereas I think if I look around uh, the world I know of large global firms, and I'm sure it's the same for many of the smaller firms, 
um, a lot of that seems to be going on. So I was quite triggered by your question, and you asked um, for an email if anything was happening, and I was just wondering, yeah. is it something which is stable? Do you see a development? Because I'm sort of, in a way, disappointed by uh, your assessment of that. So could you say a bit more about that? Thank you. Um, sure. Thank you. So it depends on what the counterfactual is, right? Uh, if you think that the, uh, if your baseline is that uh, the state ought to be doing uh, what I'm describing as pro-social, things that are in the interest of society and not necessarily in anybody's individual private interest would be a workable definition. Uh, if your baseline is that the state does it all, then anything that you see out there would seem to be a lot, right? Um, my baseline is that the state is incompetent. Uh, that's, a, that's a factual statement uh, as opposed to a statement of desire. Um, <laughs> if that's your baseline, uh, then unfortunately I think uh, despite the, and you should also distinguish uh, you know, between the rhetoric and the reality. Uh, I'm a board member of many global corporations and we put out lots of statements about how amazingly social we are and I'd like to think we are, but uh, I'm sure that there is some marketing hype to that as well. Um, so you know, in a nutshell, I think it just depends on what the baseline is. And I don't think, uh, and, you know, growing up in a country like India or watching countries in Africa develop, for instance, with the Middle East now, uh, there is still far, far more of a tendency for people to blame the state for the problems as opposed to to take action. And I'm very much by intonation and persuasion and philosophy of the point of view that, uh, that, it's individual agency that matters more, that we should take responsibility for it and do something about it, because the state is us and we are the state at the end of the day. So. I think one thing, just very quickly on this, that and particularly for the students here, so there is a big move in what you might think of as the human rights community to focus attention on the responsibility of corporate actors. Uh, some of you may know John Ruggie from the Kennedy School and the UN Global Compact. There are a number of such initiatives. And what's interesting is that they're making their way from the boardroom down to what you might think of as supplier initiatives in which Law firms, uh, as suppliers, are being asked to uh, demonstrate that they are in compliance with various kinds of social or human rights norms. And there are developing legal practices, not just in the NGO world, but in the for-profit world, around what these uh, responsibilities mean as a practical way. I think there's a big debate about how much is rhetoric and how much is reality, but if you think about what happened, for example, with diversity, or if is now happening with, say, sustainability in many places around the world, and I think part of what Tarun is saying is in the emerging economies that that kind of uh, idea has a much more bite if you could make it happen. And for those people interested in it, it's a way of thinking about it that's different than thinking about being at Human Rights Watch or, or being at an NGO. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of almost thinking even much more on sort of Monday morning reality than uh, so the human rights debates uh, justifiably received a lot of attention and people like John and others around here have been instrumental in that. Um, and that's great, but I'm saying that there's much more than that also. It's yeah. also practical things and things that just don't work outside your office and you have to take, make a role in doing that. I mean, a good example, extreme example is, you know, um, from South Africa. I don't know if any South African lawyers here, but at the height of the AIDS epidemic, uh, Anglo-American had to basically engage heavily in the health infrastructure uh, just because otherwise it probably would have had its economics collapse. Um, that's an extreme example, but that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about. Uh, not restricted to human rights, which have received attention for a long time. Even there, there is many a slip, twixt the cup and the lip, but even if we leave that aside and say common everyday reality things that we take for granted, uh, I think it de facto falls to the entrepreneur to fix it. And if uh, the system of laws and rules and so on uh, could productively engage with that thought, that would be a good thing all around. Yes, please, here. Can somebody, uh, th thank you very much. Microphone is coming. So uh, most of the comments focused predominantly on the uh, 
the sort of integration of the Indian economy into the global perspective, one of the things that I'm sort of curious to hear a little bit more about is the effect of the sort of increasingly global regulatory system, uh, either sort of, say, crimping India's capacity to grow or somehow facilitating it. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you could sort of go from the outside in as opposed to sort of internally. Thank you. Vic, you want to uh, pick up? So, so um, as an example, if you're looking at, say, uh, you know, global arbitration systems or WTO, so we have a couple of chapters in the book that explore how India's tried to build legal capacity in that space. Uh, because as India's global trading has expanded, they've had to interact more with the WTO, anti-dumping rules, uh, global arbitration systems, bit, uh, bits uh, arbitration, and so forth. And what you see is uh, essentially a version of Jugard taken uh, you know, on steroids, um, which is you have one or two players who, for a variety of reasons, get active in that space and then begin to lay the groundwork for building other parts within India to build the capacity up to a certain level. And then whether they go up beyond that level sort of depends upon what the payoff structure has been there. So, for example, think about um, WTO anti-dumping. Um, it's pretty clear that there's when one player who was very active for almost like six, seven years in pushing the development of that area of law within India, both learning about it in government, then once he's out of government in private practice, then him sort of taking juniors on to sort of train them, literally like a one-man show in some ways. Once it reaches a certain level of development, right, unless he can actually begin to capture some of the gains of trade beyond that, his incentives to do more begin to get weaker. And then the issue is, do other people pick up the slack? So a couple of players did, and some didn't. So you see sort of a lopsided development where there are a couple of players that garner a vast amount of the attention in that space, whereas it's clear that there's tons of opportunities for other people to get into it, but you haven't seen them do it yet. Part of that is just a capacity constraint in India. Um, you won't hear me say this too often, uh, but it turns out there aren't enough people in India. Um, it, it, uh, the, re the reason for that is largely that if you look at the corporate legal sector in India, although it's grown substantially in the last 15 years, it's still quite small by global standards. I think when we last looked, it was 12 or 13,000 people. Yeah. That's about as many as you might bump into in Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. Um, for a country that's four times the size, and with, a, with an, you know, a business side that's growing leaps and bounds in some ways. So that, you know, that kind of capacity constraint is important because you have people developing things, but then they're just, it'll take time for more people to get into the space. Um, and even just in terms of building capacity among students and things, even the law schools in India, um, you, know, you would think, okay, the, law, the number one law school in India must have 300 students in it or something you know, each year. So the number one law school in India takes in about 80 students a year. Um, and I'd probably say the same for the number two, the number three, the number four, right. and so forth. So that even there, there are capacity constraints in ways that you wouldn't necessarily think were present um, from the outside. I'd just say that I think one of the things we're looking at throughout, one of the reasons we're so interested in what's happening in the emerging economies is also partly the effect that they are beginning to have both individually and collectively on global systems. So it used to be a kind of one-way dynamic, but now it's much more in both directions. And Bill Alford has done great work on this, and Mark Wu and others. If you think about what the BRICS bank might look like, or you look at the way in which uh, countries are getting engaged in the rule drafting process, uh, I think that Part of it, part, one way is to think about it as a constraint, but another way is to think about it as what power will these important new emerging economies have on reshaping the global legal order as we move into the middle decades of the 21st century. Thoughts, comments? I know it's a beautiful day outside, but. <laughs> Um, well, listen, I, you know, we are very mindful. The library has done just a fantastic job with these series, and, and part of it is to give students an opportunity who have to go to classes, and my, my students in our course have to go back and check in with their offices. Uh, I hope that um, anybody who wants to stick around will be around to sign books if anybody wants to have them, but also to talk, uh, and I hope that you'll feel free to send us questions or engage with us on these uh, issues. 
issues. But on behalf of Vikram and I, uh, I just want to thank Professor Khanna for taking time out of his incredibly busy schedule to come be with us and give us those perceptive comments. So thank you all very much. Thank you.